Welcome to U.S. Bank Corp's fourth quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Following a review of the results by Andy Sasiri, Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer, and Terry Dolan, Vice Chair and Chief Financial Officer, there will be a formal question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your touchtone phone and press the pound key to withdraw. This call will be recorded and available for replay beginning today at 11 a.m. Central Time through Wednesday, January 26, 2022 at 10.59 p.m. Central Time. I will now turn the conference call over to Jen Thompson, Director of Investor Relations and Economic Analysis for U.S. Bank Corp. Thank you, Natalia, and good morning, everyone. With me today are Andy Cesari, our Chairman, President, and CEO, and Terry Dolan, our Chief Financial Officer. During their prepared remarks, Andy and Terry will be referencing a slide presentation. A copy of the slide presentation, as well as our earnings release and supplemental analyst schedules are available on our website at usbank.com. I would like to remind you that any forward-looking statements made during today's call are subject to risk and uncertainty. Factors that could materially change our current forward-looking assumptions are described on page two of today's presentation in our press release and in our Form 10-K and subsequent reports on file with the SEC. I'll now turn the call over to Andy. Thanks, Jen. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining our call. Following our prepared remarks, Terry and I will take any questions you have. I'll begin on slide three. In the fourth quarter, we reported earnings per share of $1.07 and generated total revenue of $5.7 billion. We saw strong balance sheet growth this quarter, including deposit growth of over $18 billion, or 4.3%, compared with the third quarter. Average loans grew by 2% link quarter, or 2.7% excluding the impact of loan forgiveness related to PPP. We are encouraged by the loan growth momentum, and we have a positive outlook for 2022 given improving client sentiment and business conditions, and continued strength in certain focused commercial portfolios, such as ABS lending and supply chain financing. The significant increase in liquidity provided by the strong deposit inflows this quarter puts us in a favorable position to support future balance sheet growth. Deposit growth provided the opportunity for tactical investment and cash management strategies that pressured the net interest margin for the fourth quarter, but was both accretive to net interest income and maintained asset sensitivity for our rising rate environment. Turning to fees. Underlying client acquisition and market share trends across our business lines were healthy, and payment sales trends continue to improve on a year-over-year basis. This quarter, we released $145 million in loan loss reserves, reflecting continued strong credit quality, including a record low net charge-off ratio. In the lower right quadrant, you can see that our book value per share totaled $32.71 at December 31st, which was 1.5% higher than September 30th. Our CET1 capital ratio was 10% at 31st. Slide 4 provides key performance metrics. Slide 5 highlights trends in digital engagement. Digital transactions now account for over 80% of total transactions, and digital loan sales account for two-thirds of total loan sales. Turning to slide 6, we continue to believe our initiatives aim at connecting our banking customers with our payment products and our services and our payments customers with our banking products and services will allow us to grow our small business relationships by 15 to 20 percent and related revenue by 25 to 30 percent over the next few years. Now let me turn the call over to Terry to provide more detail on the quarter. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> if you turn to slide 7, I'll start with a balance sheet review followed by a discussion of fourth quarter earnings trends. Average loans increased 2.0% compared to the third quarter, driven by a 2.6% increase in commercial loans, which benefited from new business activity and improved utilization rates. Retail loan growth was driven primarily by higher credit card balances, growth in residential mortgages, and strong production of installment loans, including auto lending. At December 31st, PPP loan balances totaled $1.4 billion compared to $2.4 billion at September 30th. Excluding PPP loans, fourth quarter average loans grew by 2.7% on a linked quarter basis. Turning to slide eight, total average deposits increased by $18.4 billion or 4.3% compared with the third quarter. 
we continued to see a favorable mix shift with an average with average non-interest bearing deposits increasing by 5.4% and average savings deposits increasing by 4.4% while higher cost time deposits declined by 3.0%. Slide 9 shows credit quality trends. The ratio of non-performing assets to loans and other real estate was 0.28% at December 31st compared with 0.32% at September 30th and 0.44% a year ago. Our fourth quarter net charge-off ratio of 0.17% improved on both a linked quarter and year-over-year basis. Borrower liquidity and stronger asset valuations continued to support repayment and recovery of problem loans. <clears throat> Our reserve release was $145 million this quarter, primarily reflecting strong credit quality metrics. Our allowance for credit losses as of September 30th, uh, 31st totaled $6.2 billion, or 1.97% of loans. Slide 10 provides an earnings summary. <clears throat> In the fourth quarter of 2021, we earned $1.07 per diluted share. These results included a reserve release of $145 million. Turning to slide 11, net interest income on a fully taxable equivalent basis of $3.2 billion came in a little higher than our expectations. The $47 million uh, decrease compared with the third quarter was driven by a $82 million decline in PPP interest and fees, partially offset by earning asset growth. Our net interest margin declined by 13 basis points on a linked quarter basis to 2.40%. The net interest margin decline was related to a six basis point impact from lower PPP loan interest and fees and a six basis point impact from elevated liquidity and related investment portfolio and cash management strategies aimed at optimizing our asset sensitivity going into 2022. Slide 12 highlights trends in non-interest income. Compared with a year ago, non-interest income declined by 0.6% as compared as strong growth in payments revenue, trust and investment management fees, deposit service charges, and commercial product revenue was more than offset by a decrease in mortgage revenue, reflecting the interest rate environment and lower uh, securities gains and other fee revenue. On a link quarter basis, Non-interest income declined by 5.9%, primarily reflecting seasonally lower payments and capital markets revenues and declining mortgage banking revenue as expected. Slide 13 provides information on our payment services businesses. Sales volumes in each of our three uh, businesses expect, uh, exceeded pre-pandemic levels in the fourth quarter despite some uh, Omicron-related softness in late December. We expect year-over-year -year payments momentum to continue into 2022 as lagging sectors such as airline hospitality and corporate T&E benefit from a continued cyclical recovery toward pre-pandemic levels and as our multi-year uh, investments in e-commerce and tech-led drive secular growth improvements. As we saw in our earnings press release this morning, effective January 3rd, U.S. Bank has eliminated fees for certain non-sufficient funds. We believe this is not only the right thing to do for customers, but it is a smart business decision. For some time, we have been at the forefront of using digital technology to help our customers avoid overdraft charges, and our efforts have helped our customers more easily and effectively manage their money, which has contributed to increased customer satisfaction. This latest move is simply the next step in the process. <clears throat> Turning to slide 14, non-interest expense increased by $104 million, or 3.0%, compared with the third quarter. This increase was driven by higher medical claims within employee benefit expense and higher professional services expenses, higher marketing and, and business development costs. Tax credit amortization expense was also higher in the fourth quarter in line with typical seasonal trends. Slide 15 highlights our capital position. Our common equity tier one capital ratio at December 31st was 10.0%, which decreased slightly compared with September 30th 
driven by risk-weighted asset growth and the impact of acquisitions completed near the end of the quarter. As a reminder, at the beginning of the third quarter, we suspended our share buyback program due to our recent announcement that we have agreed to acquire Union Bank. We continue to expect that our share repurchase program will be deferred until the second half of 2022. After the closing of the acquisition, we expect to operate at a CET1 capital ratio between our target ratio and 9.0%. I will now provide some forward-looking guidance. We expect both net interest income on a taxable equivalent basis as well as our net interest margin to be relatively stable on a linked quarter basis with growth expected in subsequent quarters. With our base case, under our base case scenario, which incorporates three rate hikes, we expect full year 2022 net interest income on a taxable, taxable equivalent basis to increase at a mid single digit pace. We expect mortgage revenue to be slightly lower in the first quarter on a link quarter basis in line with slower refinancing activity in the market. <clears throat> Payments revenue is seasonally lower in the first quarter. On a year-over-year -year basis, we expect total revenue to increase at a high single-digit pace driven by double-digit growth in both merchant processing revenue and corporate payments revenue. We expect credit card revenue to be stable on a year-over-year -year basis as high single-digit single growth in credit and debit card fees is offset by lower prepaid uh, processing fees. Excluding the prepaid headwind, which will abate after the first quarter, we expect total payment revenue to increase at a low teen rate on a year-over-year -year basis in the first quarter. We expect other revenue to approximate $125 million to $150 million per quarter over the course of 2022. We expect expenses to be relatively stable in the first quarter compared with the fourth quarter. Credit quality remains strong. Over the next few quarters, we expect the net charge-off ratio to remain lower than historical levels, but, we, but will normalize over time as the effects of the pandemic continue to subside. For the full year 2022, we expect our taxable equivalent tax rate to be approximately 21.0%. I will hand it back to Andy for closing comments. Thanks, Terry. Fourth quarter results were in line with our expectations, and we are starting off the year with momentum building across our lending and fee businesses. We feel good about the trajectory of loan growth and are well positioned to benefit from a rising rate environment. We expect client acquisition growth and account penetration to drive market share gains across our fee businesses. In particular, we believe 2022 will be another good year for our payments business. Due to the Omicron surge, year-over-year -year sales growth have slowed somewhat in the past few weeks from the exceptionally strong pace we saw in the second half of 2021. However, growth rates remain strong, and we believe this will likely prove to be a speed bump rather than an extended slowdown. Nonetheless, the situation is fluid and we'll continue to monitor trends closely and update you along the way. Our investments in technology to support our digital transformation and payments ecosystem initiatives are paying off, and we continue to look for uses of capital that will drive higher returns. In the fourth quarter, we acquired Travel Bank, a fintech that provides tech-driven expense and travel management solutions to help businesses manage their operations more efficiently. Also in the fourth quarter, we closed on the acquisition of PFM Asset Management, which not only increased our assets under management, but has enhanced our position in a niche area within the money market world. We are looking forward to closing our previously announced acquisition of Union Bank later this year. The addition of Union Bank will increase our scale, improve our market share in a demographically attractive market, and add over 1 million consumer clients and over 190,000 business banking customers to whom we can offer our leading digital capabilities and our expansive product set. The strategic and financial benefits of this combination will accrue to shareholders over many years. But the numbers only tell part of the U.S. Bank story. As we start a new year, I want to emphasize that how we do things will continue to be import as important as what we do. And so in closing, I'd like to thank our employees who come in every day with the goal of doing the right thing for our customers, our communities, their fellow employees, and our constituents. Thank you for helping to make 2021 a successful year and positioning it as well for the future. We will now open up the call to Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please press star, followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. 
Again, that's star 1. To withdraw your question, press the pound key. We will pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question is from the line of Scott Seifers with Piper Sandler. Morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Hey, um, let's see. Maybe Terry was hoping you could please discuss in just a bit more detail um, your updated thoughts on rate sensitivity, given some of the, the changes in the balance sheet in the fourth quarter. Yeah, you know, so, you know, we had the opportunity because of the deposit flows to be able to both invest in uh, investment securities uh, to help a little bit in terms of the fourth quarter, but we also um, at the same time utilize hedging strategies to keep the duration of that, uh, port, uh, of those purchases relatively short. And the, the expectation, Scott, is that, uh, you know, when uh, long-term rates rise, which we're starting to see now, that we're going to be able to unwind those uh, uh, swaps and to be able to take advantage of the uh, rising rate environment. So we did all of that uh, fundamentally to uh, be able to maintain as much asset sensitivity going into 2022 as we possibly could. Perfect. Okay, good. Thank you. And then uh, perhaps uh, either for Andy or Terry, maybe just a, a thought or comment regarding the anticipated uh, kind of composition of uh, loan growth, growth through 2022. You know, it certainly sounds like a, a constructive outlook, but maybe just kind of commercial versus consumer as you see it. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll just kind of start with fourth quarter. You know, we, one of the things we saw in the fourth quarter, not only strong consumer continuing, but uh, the C&I portfolio actually starting to expand very nicely. And uh, we talked a little bit about that. So, you know, as we look into 2022, you know, we continue to expect that consumer uh, credit is going to uh, continue to strengthen. You know, auto lending may be a little bit uh, more moderate than it was in 2022, but I think credit card continues to be very strong as payment rates uh, come down, and then we also would expect that residential mortgage portfolio loans would uh, would be growing. Uh, but I think the real story is that we're now starting to see a nice shift with respect to the commercial uh, and the C and I uh, portfolios. You know, we're continuing to see uh, growth in certain segments like uh, asset-backed uh, securitization lending and some of those sorts of things that we uh, saw earlier in the year. But uh, at the end of the uh, in the fourth quarter, in the end of the fourth quarter, you know, we saw um, nice uh, expansion of utilization rates. Uh, I think it was like 60 basis points on average, third versus fourth quarter, but in December it was up almost 2.5%. Uh, and, you know, we would expect to kind of see that. I think the uh, other thing I would say is that sentiment on the commercial side, uh, you know, people are rebuilding their inventories. Uh, I think from a supply chain perspective, they still have some concerns about that, and so I think that they're being, uh, uh, you know, cautious about making sure that they have inventory to be able to uh, run their business. Um, and, you know, and I think they're starting to make business investment ahead of the consumer spend that they see and the economic growth that they see in 2022. So, Andy, what would you add? Jerry, I think you hit the high points. Um, and, you know, two tra- changes in trends in the fourth quarter that look positive going into 2022, Scott. Number one, as Terry mentioned, the increase in utilization rates, which we haven't seen for a number of quarters. And secondly, is the start of the decline in payment rates, which helps credit card volume. So those are two positives I call out as well. Perfect. All right. Thank you very much. Your next question is from the line of Gerard Cassidy with RBC. Good morning, Gerard. Good morning. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Andy. Um, Andy, coming back to the uh, big transaction that obviously you guys are doing, you touched on all the benefits the Union Bank will bring to the table to U.S. Bancorp. Uh, can you share with us what the update is on the regulatory approval process? There's a lot of, obviously, uncertainty in Washington today at the Fed and other regulatory agencies with the heads, uh, new heads coming in over time. Maybe an update. Uh, could this be delayed? Is there What is the risk of it just being delayed uh, getting the approval? Yeah, thanks, Gerard. So we uh, submitted our application in early October. We've been working with uh, with Union Bank, and we have a number of acquisition teams, both on our side as well as the Union Bank side, working on integration activities, including technology, and as well as the business lines. And uh, we've been responding and working with the regulators in terms of questions on the on the uh, uh, submission, which is normal course for this process. So we continue to believe that this will close in the first half. Uh, it may be later in the first half, but that's our continued belief with a with a conversion um, in the late third late third third quarter uh, or, or uh, September, October timeframe. So nothing uh, 
to have us believe that it would be any different from that, and um, and we're preparing for that time frame. Very good. Thank you. Um, sure. Obviously, there's a lot of discussion on your call and other calls about asset sensitivity and what the outlook is for this year. But pivoting for a moment, um, I'm kind of looking at what we're all going to be talking about on the fourth quarter call for 22 in January of 23. And I and I get a sense it might be more about credit than it is today. And you guys have stood out as being some of the best underwriters in the industry. Can you share with us what are you seeing out there in terms of underwriting from your competitors? Um, is, are, th- are people getting more aggressive to generate revenue, uh, loan growth, or is, or no? Everybody's still pretty conservative. Yeah, you know, I, Gerard. I think that what I would the way I would kind of describe it, you know, from our perspective, we haven't changed our credit box really uh, at all. Uh, we we really try to underwrite through the cycle. I think that there has been a lot of competition uh, in the industry for loan growth over the last 12 months. And as you know, uh, you know, when the cycle turns, you know, it's it's the decisions you made today that are going to end up uh, impacting you, you know, two or three years down the road. So. Um, I, I do think that, you know, credit, uh, you know, normalizes as we go through the year. I don't know if we quite, quite get back to where we were, uh, you know, uh, pre-pandemic, but, uh, you know, I think that it will start to migrate in that direction. <clears throat> you know, I, I would say that, you know, if there is uh, loosening from an underwriting perspective, maybe a stretch it a little bit more with respect to structure, uh, you know, but it, is, it has been competitive both from an underwriting perspective as well as from a pricing perspective out there. And, and just to follow up on that quickly, Terry, how about exceptions? Are you seeing more exceptions to the credit underwriting box to get deals done? Uh, again, from our perspective, we really haven't uh, we really haven't changed our approach at all. Um, you know, again, I think from a competitive standpoint, uh, you know, again, they're focused on uh, being as competitive as they possibly can in terms of the underwriting and their uh, structures and, the, and their pricing. So, but from our perspective, we haven't really changed our approach. As always, thank you. I appreciate the color. Thanks, Gerard. Your next question is from the line of John McDonald with Autonomous Research. Morning, John. Hi, good morning, guys. Um, Andy, maybe from a high-level perspective, you might not want to give specific guidance, but just kind of your thoughts about the revenue and expense dynamics that you're looking at heading into 22. Uh, maybe some thoughts on the the revenue headwinds and tailwinds that you're looking at and how you plan on managing inflation on the expense space, you know, and just kind of an overall how does operating leverage feel as a goal for this year? Sure, John. And, uh, you know, Terry gave a little guidance on net interest uh, income for the year, but I, w- I will talk about uh, the, the full the full balance sheet and income statement. We, we continue to expect mid- single-digit earning asset growth for the year. That loan momentum that we talked about uh, looks positive going into 2022. We would expect revenue growth of 3 to 4%, John, on a full-year basis, uh, as well as positive operating leverage of at least 100 basis points for 2022. Got it. And then on the uh, – maybe just a question on the NII guide, Terry. Uh, you mentioned three hikes. Uh, just what's the cadence of what you've built in on that? And is there any rule of thumb for what one Fed hike of 25 basis points does uh, to the NIM or NII, everything else equal? That might be helpful for us. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, you know, our base case, uh, as, I, as we said, uh, bakes in three rate hikes really starting in the second quarter and then, you know, kind of uh, as you might expect through the rest of the year. Um, what we, if you go back to our, just our disclosures at the end of the third quarter, it really hasn't changed a lot. You know, a 50 basis point shock uh, is about 3.5% uh, from, a, from a net interest income standpoint. So that I would kind of refer you back to that. If you think about, you know, three rate hikes uh, kind of uh, on that pace, you're probably talking about uh, the equivalency of about a 35 basis point uh, shock. Um, you know, so if you're kind of doing the math, you can kind of go to that. And, Terry, all those numbers are uh, the impacts of net interest income. In addition, we have our waivers, which uh, total about $70 million a quarter, John, and you get about two-thirds of that back at the first rate hike of 25 basis points and about 90% of it back at the second rate hike. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Sure. 
Your next question is from the line of Betsy Grazik with Morgan Stanley. Hi, good morning. Hey, Betsy. Hey, Betsy. Hey, uh, a couple of questions. Just on the guide, a couple of cleanups. Um, the NII mid-single-digit pace, is that a Q on Q from one Q, or that's a full year 22 versus full year 21 excluding Union Bank? Uh, that uh, Everything is excluding Union Bank, and it's uh, the, the, it tended to be the guidance that we're giving for 2022. Right, so that's that's full versus full year 21. Full, full year full year versus full year, yeah. Right, right, right. Okay, all right, just want to make sure. Um, and then when I'm thinking about um, – the positive operating leverage of, you know, at least 100 basis points. Um, that's obviously a nice uptick uh, from from what you've been doing recently. Can you, over the past couple of years, I guess, um, can you kind of highlight, is this a function of, you know, the rate environment being better primarily, or is it also uh, from some of the investments that you've been making that you are uh, leveraging and, and, you know, basically able to, uh, switch on the optimization side of the investment spend. Yeah, Betsy, I would say it's kind of a combination of both. I mean, the the improving revenue environment certainly helps that. But, you know, we have been, as you say, making some significant investment in digital capabilities. And, you know, as that investment matures, you know, we kind of fully expect that we would see some uh, operating efficiencies on the expense side. You know, we have been working through uh, tech modernization, which, you know, that helps us and, uh, you know, we're always looking for kind of uh, from a continuous improvement point of view, uh, you know, trying to optimize, you know, the branch network as well as our operations. So I think it's it's a combination of both. Okay, and on the investment spend side, there's there'll be some in integrating Union Bank, um, of course, but beyond that, you know, where would you be targeting investment dollars from here? Yeah, you know, I think that uh I think that uh you know, when we think about our technology investment, you know, continuing uh to have investment in our mortgage business and uh our digital uh mobile app capabilities, but a strong focus on uh real-time payments, money movement and on the whole B2B side of the equation is going to be important. And then of course, we've been talking about the ecosystem between our payments business and our business banking. And so we'll continue to make investment there. Uh, you know, so I, I think it's kind of a continuation of many of the the same themes that we've had over the last year. Uh, you know, we, on a core basis, we really don't expect any significant increase in the investment levels, but we continue to, to uh, uh, expect that we will maintain those investment levels going forward. Got it. Okay, thanks for the color on that. Thanks, Patsy. Your next question is from the line of Ken Houston with the Jefferies. Hi, good morning, guys. Um, Hi, Ken. A couple, a couple of NII cleanups, please. Um, so you mentioned that uh, PPP was an $80 million decline, which I think was bigger than what you had anticipated uh, previously uh, at 60 to 70. I'm just wondering, um, what is in, uh, what kind of PPP decline do you still have in that first quarter outlook for NII flat sequentially? Yeah, so I mean, uh, the, the decline from third to fourth quarter was the most significant. It was a little bit higher than what we had expected. Part of that is because uh, some of what we had expected to occur in 2022 actually kind of got pulled forward into the fourth quarter. You know, currently in our, our baseline or our expectation is that there will be a, a very uh, immaterial decline in PPP going from fourth to first. It's about, it's about 15, 16 million dollars, so it's pretty insignificant. Okay, and is that the last kind of meaningful step down from there? There's a pretty much wind out from there, just trying to get to like that baseline where we can, you know, move yeah, past that, the PPP. That, that, I really, I, we look at 2022 as being past PPP in all uh, respects. So yes, I would agree that the first quarter is probably the last step down that we have, and again, it's not really significant, and it's incorporated into our guidance. Yep. Okay. Second question. Uh, obviously, you did decide to buy securities. It's like thirty something billion. The yield on the book went down a little bit. I'm just wondering if you can help us understand uh, the premium AM delta and also just, you know, where you're buying versus runoff front book, back book at this point. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, you're right. We did step up the investment portfolio a lot. It has to do with uh, what I talked about earlier and that uh, deployment of excess cash. Um, you know, we 
we made that deployment in the fourth quarter uh, and, you know, while we did it in treasuries, we swapped it short. And so, you know, that is why you see net interest margin coming down as well as the yields related to the investment portfolio coming down. But we also did that because we want maximum flexibility as rates are, as long-term rates start to rise. You know, we would expect to kind of unwind that, uh, you know, the benefit uh, coming through in 2022. So that's, that's kind of how we're positioning it. Uh, in terms of the overall investment portfolio, the vast majority of it was shorter term uh, and with the with the hedging strategies. And just to follow up on that, so, so when you say you unwind it, do you mean that you'd, you're at the right size now or you'd rather see it go into loans? Meaning, like, how do you think about the mix of the balance sheet and earning asset mix as you look further ahead? Yeah, as we go as we go as we go forward, I would expect that our investment portfolio will be rel- relatively flat to fourth quarter levels. That's kind of our expectation. So, the vast majority of earning asset growth is uh, more on the loan side than it is uh, in other areas. Okay, understood. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Your next question is from the line of John Penpari with Avacor. Right, John. Morning, John. Morning. Uh, just on the loan growth front, um, I heard the color you gave in terms of some of the drivers you saw in the quarter on the commercial side, et cetera, the end of period balances came in a fair amount above average. Is that a good indicator as we model out? And then separately, anything you can attribute aside from just the continued macro strengthening to the notable strength you saw in end of period growth? This quarter, I mean, it's better than a lot of the, your, your peer banks. Any uh, calling efforts or pricing campaign or anything else to call out on that front? Thanks. Yeah, so you're you're right, uh, John. We did see some pretty significant growth in terms of end of period balances. I think that that sets us up well with respect to 2022. You know, one of the things that's a little bit hard, you know, because you have you have LIBOR transition and everything else happening. Uh, you know, we don't know whether or not, you know, some of that is just people pulling forward LIBOR a little bit um, into 2021. But, you know, when we talk to our customers, I guess, you know, the, the thing that uh, that we see is that, you know, the underlying momentum, and the underlying sentiment is pretty strong. Uh, you know, they're actively out uh, building their inventories again, you know, and, and all those sorts of things, I think is, uh, you know, when we think about kind of our baseline growth going into 2022, why we're pretty optimistic. Uh, but you are right, the end of period balance growth was uh, pretty significant for us. And it wasn't, and it wasn't because of any, you know, one specific thing that we were doing. It was pretty broad based across, across segments, across categories, and, uh, you know, across geographies. Got it. Thanks, Terry. That's helpful. And then, Separately, on the payment side, just a higher level, given the you know, clearly intensely competitive payments backdrop, um, uh, I want to see if you can kind of elaborate on U.S. bankrupt's value proposition in the payments business as, as we continue to get this, this macro um, reopening or strengthening. And as T&E spend rebounds, as you've been flagging, how would you characterize your positioning in terms of a value proposition for customers. Thanks. Yeah, John. So we've talked about the fact that we're trying to really weave together our banking products together with our payment products and a comprehensive product set to help businesses, business banking customers, basically manage the way they're running their cash flows and their business on a day-to-day basis. And And that's our value proposition, is that combination of payments and banking in easy to use dashboard information to help them run their businesses and and manage their cash flows on a day-to-day basis that's consistent with the uh, the travel bank acquisition that we made in the in the third quarter and other acquisitions bento and and others that we made earlier in the year so that's the objective um, and we'll continue to to focus on that and I, I would highlight the simplicity component of that the navigation the simplicity of use is a real key to that on a go-forward basis Got it. All right, thanks. And then one follow-up to that, Andy, just, just regarding that strategy, do you think you need bolt-on deals um, or anything on the fintech side to continue to affect that strategy, or do you think you have what you need? You know, I think we, uh, we've we made a lot of investment, uh, both organic as well as acquisition, in this capability. We're going to continue to uh, focus on it, as Terry mentioned, but I think we have most of what we need. We just continue to model, uh, refine 
the capabilities and simplify the offering. Got it. Thanks, Andy. Sure. Your next question is from the line of Bill Carcacci with Wolf Research. Morning, Bill. Morning, Bill. Hey, uh, morning, Andy and Terry. Um, I wanted to follow up on slide six. Within your business banking relationship at the left, uh, there was a modest increase in the number of customers that are now also payment customers from last quarter. Can you frame for us what the revenue benefit is of, of seeing that light blue region continue to grow over time? And you know, how high can that 28% go? Well, again, we, we think that we can get uh, uh, additional movement on both of those charts, more banking customers using payments capabilities and more banking using payments. We talk about the number of customers, the revenue in that total bucket is about a billion and a half dollars as we think about the penetration. So that's that's the base we're working with. Uh, understood. And, and then maybe separately, uh, can, can you give a little, little bit of color on the process for converting some of those business banking customers, uh, you know, the business banking only customers in that, that dark blue region? Uh, to also be users of your payment products. Just curious what the receptivity has been so far. And, yeah, it's... Uh, and have come across any pushback from customers who may already be using alternative payment solutions, or, or has the, the customer base been broadly receptive? You know, I would say that uh, it's early innings, uh, Bill. Let me start there. But I think the, the fundamental uh, offering, which is a, a simple, easy-to-use combination of banking and payments products in one simple dashboard to have, help them manage your cash flows, is a receptive uh, thought from a from a consumer from a business standpoint. So, um, and and that's really what we're focused on. Again, many of the customers have a banking product or a payments products, but it's weaving it together for that offering that we're focused on. And and the receptivity of that has been pretty strong. Got it. Uh, and then lastly, if I could squeeze in a lot, one final one uh, on the increase in, in expenses. Um, you know, attributable to compensation and employee benefits. Can you parse out for us how much of that was a function of greater production versus inflationary pressures and, you know, how much of that upward pressure you'd expect to persist? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, certainly what we ended up seeing, uh, for example, in the uh, capital markets business, it was uh, stronger. So some of it is related to production incentives. Um, you know, a fair amount of it in the fourth quarter is also related to uh, performance-based incentives that are driven by the overall performance of the company. So, you know, we did, we certainly did see that. You know, I would say, and, and maybe Andy, you want to comment as well, you know, certainly there is a lot of competition for talent that's out there. And I think the pressure is, especially when you're looking for, you know, high-skilled areas and technology and development payments uh, uh, and or digital sort of space uh, you know if you're if you're in the hiring mode uh, you're you're paying uh, top dollar in order to be able to acquire that but um, you know that that uh, uh, competition for talent is certainly you know increasing and out there I think that's right Terry and, and sometimes it takes a little longer and sometimes it's a little bit more expensive but that's all been incorporated in the guidance that we offered for 2022. And then as a reminder, you know, we um, the other area that is uh, uh, challenging in this environment is, is um, entry-level employees on the branch side, and we, we get the benefit of uh, having Union Bank uh, combined with us uh, this year, which I think is a positive. And as we talked about, we're committing to uh, frontline employees on the branch side to employment. And in, in this environment, that's a positive. Very helpful. Thank you for taking my questions, Amy and Terry. Sure. Your next question is from the line of David Long with Raymond James. Good morning, everyone. Hey, David. Hey, David. The, the, the last remaining question I have is, is related to your reserve level. And if you look back pre-pandemic, um, I think you guys were targeting close to 2% in reserves. You're, you're below that now, just below that. What is the right CISO level of reserves for U.S. Bank Corp here? And, and within your current reserves, um, on the qualitative side, how much do you have built in for, you know, maybe Omicron or, or the pandemic still still as part of that? Yeah, David, I mean, probably the way I would describe the last one is, you know, we, we still certainly believe that there's some level of uncertainty that's out there in the economy. And so we take that into consideration when we go through the different scenarios that we kind of model out. Uh, maybe kind of coming back to your first question, 
um, you know, you know, what is the right level? I mean, obviously that's going to end up impact, you know, based upon economic outlook and what happens with respect to credit quality. But what I would, what I would say, and you're right, we started, uh, you know, the uh, pre-pandemic or at uh, the adoption of CECL at about 2%. When you end up looking at the mix of the portfolio and how it's shifted, uh, we're, we're kind of right at, uh, you know, we're right at kind of the level that we had started with, I guess, is the way I would describe it. Um, you know, from a reserving point of view, kind of, I would just kind of keep in mind from, in terms of CECL, uh, you have to provide for loan growth on day one. And so, you know, as, as loan portfolio, uh, you know, start to grow across the industry, I think that that dynamic of reserve release will probably change a bit, uh, going into 2022. Um, and again, all of that's been kind of taken into consideration when we're thinking about uh, you know, our uh, baseline forecast for 2022. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate the color. Mm -hmm. Your next question is from the line of Mike Mayo with Wells Fargo Securities. Hey, Mike. Uh, hi. Mm -hmm. okay. um, my, my, I'm going to give the question, then I'll give a wind-up, and I'll come back. But my question is, why are you not planning for even higher positive operating leverage in 2022. Um, and as, as you know, you know, going back in time, you know, it, was, it was either some combination of Jerry Grunhoff or Jack Grunhoff or Richard Davis who said, if you grow revenues faster than expenses, great things happen. And I've asked this question before. For the last five years, you guys have had negative operating leverage. And during that time, the stock price uh, has barely moved as of year end when banks are up almost half and the market has doubled. So I think there's some uh, relationship between the two. So it's it's good that you're guiding uh, for positive operating leverage in 2022. I think that'd be the first year in six years when you'd achieve that on, on a core basis. Um, but I think you're guiding for 7 to 9% revenue growth for this year. So I guess that implies 6 to 8% expense growth, which still seems to be a lot of spending. I get it. There's, there's wage pressures. Um, so it seems to me that just from the benefit of rates, you can get the positive operating leverage, um, which means the tech investments aren't paying off to the bottom line. Maybe I'm, I don't question whether they're paying off your conservative, trustworthy bank, um, but are the tech investments paying off in a way that we as investors can see those, and why don't you have higher positive operating leverage guidance? Thanks. Yeah, well, let, let, let me start with revenue just because I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Uh, you know, in earlier in the comments, we talked about the fact that we expect total revenue growth in 2022 to be in the range of 3 to 4 percent. When you think about the components of it, Mike, uh, you know, the net interest income is probably going to be uh, at the higher end or maybe even a little bit above that range. The fee income is probably going to be growing at the lower end or maybe a little bit below that range. And the primary uh, drivers, when you think about fee income, uh, you know, we're still going to see in a rising rate environment mortgage banking revenue coming down. Uh, and then, uh, you know, in our at least residual portfolio, end of term losses will be coming, or end of term gains will be coming down a bit. And that shows up in other income. So I think that there's a couple of things that will mute the growth in fee income. Uh, you know, the other thing that we talked about a little bit earlier is, some changes in terms of our overall, uh, our overdraft, um, you know, uh, pricing, and that's going to have a bit of a drag in terms of deposit service charges in terms of fee income. So, you know, the range of growth, again, for, for 2022 in terms of total revenue is uh, in that 3 to 4% range. Uh, so maybe that kind of uh, level sets us with respect to, you know, our guidance or our expectations for revenue. You know, on the expenses, and I'll have Andy kind of weigh in, but, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, at least 100 uh, basis points of positive operating leverage, uh, you know, is uh, is kind of what our expectation or target is. You know, that's going to be balancing short-term and long-term, uh, you know, expectations in terms of investment. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, uh, 
we're we're very committed to being able to deliver at least that uh, in 2022. So, Andy, what would you add regarding the investment? Yeah, Mike, and you know, just to to comment on your your question overall, you know, we've been focused on making uh, the necessary investments in our digital capabilities and our payments businesses. We've talked about that. We talked to you about that, and our objective is to position ourselves to be successful in this environment. And and I think we are. We're in a strong position, and I think you're going to start to see the benefits both from a revenue growth standpoint as well as an expense efficiency standpoint. Uh, particularly as we see the secular trend starting to increase uh, overall. So uh, we made those investments uh, eyes wide open, you know, very intentional, while at the same time balancing some short-term expense opportunities on the operating core ba- basis. So, But I think uh, on a go-forward basis, you're going to see positive operating leverage uh, because of those investments. So just to follow up on the technology part, um, you know, when we think about your – level of investments, is that still increasing? Is it increasing at a slower rate? Uh, and my understanding was your past investments were, were for foundation building, non-revenue areas, and now the investments are for revenue areas. So if you could just think in terms of the tech investing relative to the payoff, where are you in terms of reaping those benefits? Yeah, Mike, we're, we're level off, so we're not going to continue to see increases in those investments. We did see some increases in the past five years, but I think we're at a level set uh, uh, area right now, number one. Number two, we migrated from about 40-60 defense and offense to 60-40 offense right now. So most of the investments we're making are for revenue-generating uh, areas, uh, digital capabilities, payments, business banking, and the other things we've talked about. And the other thing that I would just add maybe is, and this is really more kind of looking into 2023, we don't really see a need to increase the amount of investment uh, even with bringing Union Bank uh, into the U.S. Bank fold. And that's because, uh, as we've talked about in the past, most of this is just a lift and shift from their systems to ours. And so we'll be able to leverage all the investment that we've been making and bring a lot of digital capabilities to you know their customer base. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Your next question is from the line of Vivek Juneja with J.P. Morgan. Hey, Vivek. How are you doing? Hi, Andy. Hi, Terry. A um, couple of questions. Credit cards, your were period end was up only, a, it seems like, 1.5% link quarter. You saw a bigger jump in uh, certainly the Fed weekly data. Any color on what's going on there, you know, why it was uh, slow for you guys? In terms of credit card revenue, credit card and debit card revenue? No, credit card, no credit card loans, period and loans. Oh, yeah, you know, I the what, what's really being still impacted, at least for us, is, uh, you know, the payment rate is still relatively high. It did peak in the third quarter. It came down just a little bit in the fourth quarter. You know, so until we start to see that measurably improve, uh, you know, the, I think that that's going to end up impacting growth rates of credit card loan balances. Our expectation, though, Vivek, is that, you know, the, those payment rates do start to migrate down nicely uh, as 2022 goes, uh, you know, progresses. And so I do think that that's going to be a bit of a tailwind for us as we think about loan growth. And, and it will also help uh, net interest margin and, and obviously net interest income. Um, second question, the merchant processing decline uh, in fees that you saw quarter over quarter, was that all Omicron related in coming in December or was there something else going on there too? Yeah, from, thir- from third to fourth quarter, uh, that's really, yeah. I mean, it, it, very, very little is really related to Omicron. We did see a little bit of a slow up uh, that was kind of late in December. Uh, really what is happening there is that as sales continue to pick up in travel uh, and, uh, and uh, in, in that sector, that tends to be a little bit of a different rate. Or, uh, and so it's more of a mixed thing than it is anything else, uh, Vivek. Okay. Right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Your final question is from the line of Erica Najarian with the UBS. Morning, Erica. Hey, Erica. I'm trying to figure out, um, given um, your outlook for positive operating leverage, why the stock has opened um, so weakly. So maybe following up on, on Vivek's question, um, I, I think that the street had anticipated, um, you know, um, a, a, a much 
lower or lesser seasonal step down in payments. So w what happened with the interchange rate in the quarter? Um, yeah, I mean, so let, let me kind of just kind of step back and when we think about uh, kind of seasonality in the payments business overall, <clears throat> usually from third, from third to fourth quarter, credit and debit card, uh, depending upon the amount of investment we're making uh, at that particular point in time, is usually, uh, you know, fourth quarter is a little bit better than third quarter. But merchant and uh, corporate payments, typically, uh, you know, fourth quarter is seasonally lower and that's uh, fundamentally kind of what we saw both in terms of merchant and corporate. Now, corporate ends up getting impacted by government spend, which tends to be highest in the third quarter. Uh, you know, you get the effect of holidays uh, uh, impacting travel and those sorts of things with respect to payments and that sort of thing. That's why that tends to step down. So I think what we ended up seeing is uh, fairly similar to what we would have expected in terms of the seasonality of the businesses. And the, the lower interchange rate that you mentioned on slide 12, was that anything unusual there? Yeah, I mean, the again, I think that that ends up getting impacted by the mix of the business. So as travel grows, the interchange rates and the margins associated with that particular business in the merchant acquiring is at narrower spreads. And so as that is recovering, uh, you know, it's, it ends up impacting the margins a little bit. Got it. Okay. Um, and just to take another step back, you know, on your net interest income guide um, for, you know, three rate hikes mid single digit, what kind of deposit betas are, are you assuming? You know, I think everybody is, um, you know, very well aware that your corporate trust deposits are quite rate sensitive. Um, but has there been a change in your mix since the 15, 18 rate cycle? And in, in general, how, what have you baked into your NII guide for deposit repricing and what do you expect to actually happen? Yeah, so maybe at a high level, uh, you know, typically what we see in the early stages of uh, rising rates is that, you know, deposit betas don't move a lot in any, in any of the uh, different categories, but you are right, uh, the trust uh, corporate trust deposits tend to be a little bit more sensitive uh, as you get into maybe the second or third rate hike. And so, you know, when we think about uh, maybe that first 50 basis points, um, you know, we would expect deposit betas to probably be in that 15 to 25 range uh, and then progressively getting a little bit stronger as the cycle continues. But And that's that's kind of how we think about it now. I would say that, um, you know, when we have looked at the mix of business we have had, you know, you know uh, today versus, let's say, uh, four or five years ago, uh, you know, we have kind of a strong mix of consumer base uh, where we have seen a lot of the growth in uh, deposits uh, in 2021 uh, was actually on the consumer side of the equation uh, as opposed to uh, some of the other businesses. And so, you know, the deposit betas, my expectation to be deposit betas especially in the early stages, are probably a little bit uh, lower than what we have experienced in the past. I got it. And just maybe a last one um, for Andy. Um, you know, as we think about um, USC in a cost inflationary environment, but in an environment where you, as you said, you know, to Mike, where your investment spend is steady state, you know, what is really the underlying you know, you forget your 22, but going forward next three years, what is the underlying expense growth of this company? And, um, you know, you had mentioned, I think, at a, at a conference a conference in, um, in 2021 that low 50s is something that you could achieve from an efficiency standpoint. Is that something that can only be achieved with um, the deals that you have pending? So, so Erica, um Part of uh, achieving that is also getting back to a more normal revenue environment, which we're starting to migrate to with rates, as, as we've talked about in terms of our assumptions. Um, I would expect uh, next year, again, that revenue growth to be well below, uh, that expense growth to be well below revenue growth and that positive operating leverage, and I would expect us to achieve that on a go-forward basis. We've made the investments to position ourselves to be successful. 
Those investments are going to result in additional revenue, but also importantly, more efficiencies in the operations. Those digital capabilities allow us to do things more effectively and more efficiently. We've also optimized the branch network, and we're going to continue to focus on that. So it's sort of this balance, uh, Erica, of optimizing the current to continue to invest for the future, and that's what we've done, and that's what we'll continue to do. Okay. We do have a follow-up from the line of John McDonald <clears throat> with Autonomous Research. Hey, John. Hi. Uh, hey, thanks. Uh, two quick follow-ups, one for Terry, one for Andy. Uh, Terry, could you quantify the impact of the changes you're making, the customer-friendly changes uh, to the NSF and OD fees and what that might be for this year on a go-forward basis as well? And then, uh, Andy, just kind of wondering, uh, with all the dynamics in Washington, people are worried about the deal approval process for you and others getting delayed. Um, what's the cost of that to the organization? Are you doing a lot of prep work that gets put on hold? And if you kind of end up, if you do end up waiting longer for approval, um, what kind of cost is that uh, to the organization? And just some thoughts on that would be helpful. Thank you both. Yeah, so let, let me address the uh, the overdraft. Um, you know, if you end up looking at our call reports, uh, you know, 2021, I think our overdraft fees were about a little, a little less than 2% of total revenue or $340 million. And 20, uh, on a uh, full, fully implemented sort of basis, we would expect that that impact of the changes we're making is probably in that 160 to $170 million. And, uh, it'll we'll, we'll probably end up realizing about 75% of that next year. And the other thing that I would just mention is that, you know, with fee waivers, from a fee income standpoint, and we've taken both these things into consideration, fee waivers will help offset most of that. Okay. Terry, uh, sorry, just next year, does that mean like next well, this year? or? Yeah, in, 20, in 2022, we would realize about 75% of the full, year, full effect. Yeah. Okay. And John, you know, we're not incurring a lot of incremental expense right now as part of the integration efforts. We have teams working on it, but they're not what I would call incremental in, in nature. The the impact of a delay would be really delaying the the efficiencies and the cost takeouts that we projected for you, um, and and that would be the principal impact. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Sure. I will turn the call back over for any closing remarks. Okay, thank you everyone for listening to our earnings call. Please contact the Investor Relations Department if you have any follow-up questions. This concludes the U.S. Bank Corp's fourth quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.